What's up, everybody? I, uh, sorry, I had to swallow. <laughs> so, I'm drinking a lot of water and everything. I thought it would be cool to show you uh, five books uh, outside of uh, the Bible, besides Scripture, five books that were actually influential in my life from a theological standpoint, from an apologetic standpoint, and all the other different standpoints there are. And so, in no particular order, uh, I just want to show you five books that if you don't have them in your library, I would really encourage you to get them uh, for the reasons that I will explain. And the first one right off the bat, I loaned out, I, gave, I didn't loan it, I gave it out, uh, my Grasping God's Word uh, hermeneutics book. Uh, and I really wish I could get that back, but it's in good hands and it's being used. It's a great tool. But this is another one by Walter Kaiser. It's called Introduction to Biblical Hermeneutics. And I think first and foremost, anybody that wants to study God's word, anybody that wants to actually know truly what is scripture about, how do we accurately uh, divide the word of God, as Paul writes to Timothy? And we got to go ahead and look at the different aspects of scripture. Understand that there's poetry, that there's narrative, that there's wisdom, uh, all these different genres, all these different books, if you will. Uh, epistles being one of them, um, uh, apocalyptic genre, revelation. We need to understand what genre they're in. We also need to understand uh, really grammar, how a sentence is built, what are the moods, what are the tenses, things like that. Then we need to understand the cultural uh, context. What was life like for them back then? And so if you don't have one, I would highly encourage you to get a uh, hermeneutic book. This one's by... Walter Kaiser, but like I said, I think it was a maybe it was Scott W. Scott Duvall, I believe it was grasping God's word was very influential to me. I got another video on it uh, talking about how to properly interpret scripture, and I'd encourage you to add that to your library. The next one is the next two are apologetically uh, minded books, and for a long time there, I, I used to listen to this guy read his books and. They were over my head. So it took me some time of just pondering, thinking about the things, and, and just growth and development, the spirit just really working in me to sort of understand this topic more, and that's the topic of apologetics. But this is Ravi Zacharias' book, Jesus Among Other Gods. And I know he has a newer one out, uh, Jesus Among, I think it's the Secular Gods. But this one points out a lot of very interesting things. Uh, for instance, all the major world uh, religions do believe in a Jesus. Also, when you look at all the major world religions and their savior, if you will, or their prophet or messenger, the only one that is described to be sinless is Jesus of Nazareth. Muhammad, uh, matter of fact, when Muhammad received the revelation of Gabriel, it went contrary to what they taught back then. That having these dreams and revelations, uh, they would say that you're demon-possessed. But yet, his revelation of from the angel Gabriel over like 23 years or whatever it was, uh, for some reason, it wasn't demon possession. It was just him creating this religion. But that's a side tangent. But it talks about Krishna and, and the playfulness of him. Uh, it talks about Muhammad and needing forgiveness for his sins. Even Muhammad didn't have assurance of his salvation. But this book goes in more than just that. It goes into a lot of the claims. It talks about uh, the problem of evil, theodicy, I believe is what it's called, and a lot of other things. So if you really want a book that talks mainly about the uniqueness of Jesus of Nazareth, I would recommend this book, Jesus Among Other Gods. The next one, is we're still going to be in the apologetics realm, but this is actually by uh, Pastor Timothy Keller, The Reason for God. I got this book a long time ago, and it's really served me quite well. Whereas Ravi Zacharias is more of the philosophical, over-your-head, intellectual book, uh, RZIM's ministry, uh, they, they say, helping the believer think and the thinker believe. And so it's deep, it's profound. Timothy Keller brings the stuff down at our level so that we're able to understand and digest it. I'm sorry, too many young living oils right now. But it talks about the aspect of morality. It talks about how God goes ahead and you know, reveals himself to the world. It 
talks about literal interpretation of scripture, when and how. It talks about the claim that science disproves Christianity. That's not the case. Uh, it talks about, you know, a lot of the questions that people levy against Christianity. For instance, Christianity is a straitjacket. Or how can a loving God send people to hell? Or the church is responsible for much injustice. He answers a lot of those questions in a very easy to understand and very easy to uh, give out, regurgitate, if you will. I don't like using that word for me, but sometimes I do regurgitate because it's great information. So this does answer a lot of good questions. For instance, on the back here, it says, how does God allow suffering? How could a loving God send people to hell? Why isn't Christianity more inclusive? How can there be only one true religion? Why have so many wars been fought in the name of God? And so Timothy Keller, this is a great book, The Reason for God. If you have those questions and everything, I would highly encourage you to check it out. Well, I'm going to add one, actually. I'm going to add one. I had this for a while. I lost it. And I was trying to find it again and everything for a long time. And it took me a, a long, exhaustive search till I found it again. Billy Graham's Angels. What this book does is this breaks down uh, the different classes of angels, the different ministries of angels, and, and things like that. This is copyrighted uh, back in 1975 is when this was written and everything. And so this talks about a lot of different aspects from what he believes and from scriptural. Are they visible, invisible? How do they differ from man? Is there an organization, a hierarchy, if you will? Uh, how is God's uh, angels used in judgment or deliverance? What about the gospel? All of the different aspects of angels. And you can see how old it is because the pages are, well, worn. Uh, this is a great book. If you can find it, it's pretty, you know, easy read. It's more of a reference book. I would highly encourage you to get it. Also, he has a lot of uh, stories, case studies about certain things, certain events that shows the plausibility of angels, as Hebrew says, are ministering spirits for those that inherit salvation. And so he has case studies of those. Oh, now everything's falling apart. I get my Little River Canyon picture back up. All right, two other books and I'll be done and I'll, uh, I'll be quiet. For a long time, I used to wrestle with Calvinism. I used to go ahead and, and why did God harden the Pharaoh's heart? Why does God say, you know, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy and and uh, and I'm the potter, you're the clay and all these other aspects. Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. Uh, was Calvinism legit? Is Calvinism true? Uh, and, and so I had... Got this book from a friend of mine, The Other Side of Calvinism. This is not an easy read. As you can tell, it's almost the size width of my head. See, it's even, it's bigger than my head. This is over 700 pages, but this goes into the entire, this is a five-point system. I know there's a lot of different variations of Calvinism. This breaks down the tulip. Uh, the total depravity, which actually is not depravity, it's inability, and uh, it's complete contrary to scripture, unconditional election, irresistible grace, perseverance of saints, limited atonement. So the tuple, <laughs> since I spelled it out of order. But this book is not an easy read, but it gives a lot of clarity. Talks about some of the foremost reformers, <laughs> foremost reformers, their views on different scriptures and passages, uh, one of them being Arthur Pink, and then you know, shows how they're misusing scripture doing what's called eisegesis. Uh, not eisegesis, eisegesis, you know, you get the point. So, the other side of Calvinism. Big book. Well, just lost my picture and you just seen the hidden spot back there. Okay, the last book. And if you really want to understand what Scripture is about, if you really want to understand Jesus' earthly ministry, 
in order to interpret scripture, you got to understand not just uh, the historical context, but you got to understand the cultural context as well. In the first book that I was talking about, Grasping God's Word, they have a picture of two towns with a river dividing them. One town was us. The other town was them then, you know, the audience back then. And so in the gospel accounts, it would be that first century Jewish audience. And so it talked about what did it mean to them then? What are the similarities and differences between them and us, the river, and there's a bridge also. And how can we apply those similarities, that principle from them to us today? I have another video, like I said, talking about it. But one of the missing ingredients of this process aspect of interpretation is understanding things from a Jewish context. Why did Jesus say some of the things he said? Why did he do some of the things he did and everything? And our church, they're going through the Life of the Messiah uh, series, talk, talking about the gospel accounts and the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. This is volume one. I have volume one and two. I still need three. Uh, if you're listening and you want to get me a copy of volume three, I'd be much appreciative. Otherwise, I'll, I'll get it on my own in my own time and everything. But this right here breaks down... Uh, Jewish context, certain idioms, like, did Jesus actually get crucified on a Friday? What's the idea on that? If he was going to be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, in the grave, if he rose Sunday morning, how is it that he could be crucified on Friday? And once you understand things from a Jewish perspective, you can understand that any part of Friday was considered the whole day, the morning and the evening. Then you got Saturday morning and the evening. Then any part of Sunday is, again, considered the entirety. It's called a figure of speech. It's called the Ona, I believe is what it is, in Judaism, Jewish figure of speech. This shed light on that. And it sheds light on a lot of other things, too. So the one missing piece about biblical interpretation is the Jewish culture, uh, the Jewish context to better understand certain things. And so I would highly encourage anybody to get this book. It's called Yeshua because, yes, that was the Hebrew name of Jesus. It was Yeshua. And so this would give a lot of clarity. So those are my five, well, five and a half, I said Billy Graham Angels book, six books that are influential in me, my development that I've learned a lot under. And so I'd encourage you to check out all these, uh, any one of them, however you see fit. Add them to your library. But I'm curious, what are some of your favorite books in theology, apologetics, whatever the case is? Let me know in the comments below. If you like this video, don't forget to subscribe because I'll be doing some more videos, uh, working on doing interview sessions with different people, getting other people on the channel so you don't have to look at this mug all the time and hear this voice all the time. You can hear different people. And so I look forward to that and everything. Otherwise, you know, like I said, let me know in the comments below what some of your favorites are. Uh, let me know if you disagree with some of these. If so, why and everything. Let's talk through it. Uh, but otherwise, thank you for watching. Until next time, God bless.